Welcome, everybody. Uh, now we will explore successful cases that exemplify the power of additive manufacturing. I welcome our panel and hand over the floor to our moderator, Marta Silvia Leal Gonzalez. Uh, she's Director of Planning and Knowledge Management at E2T2 Nuevo León. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here in the company of this, these distinguished uh, guests, uh, panelists. And I'm going to introduce them first. Uh, we have uh, Leopoldo Ruiz, National Head of the Additive and Digital Manufacturing Lab, MADIT, at the Univer Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Uh, Rafik Ahmad, Visionary Associate Professor at the University of, of Alberta, shaping uh, future engineering sis, uh, systems and pioneering green technologies. I said Ahmad, but it's Ahmad. He already told me that's okay. <laughs> and Aishol Lamikis, distinguished professor at the University of the Basque County, country, a leading force in advanced manufacturing, laser technology, and prolific research. So welcome everyone again, you know, and um, I, <coughs> this panel, as uh, Dora said, aims to let us know about how successful inroads have been made in sustainable additive manufacturing and how academia is creating, transforming, and promoting the competences needed for bioengineering students to use this technology. So just to give some context to the relevance of this panel, let me start by saying, as we have seen in the morning that we have been in the conference here, that additive manufacturing or 3D printing represents a paradigm shift in the way we design, produce, and distribute products. The essence of additive manufacturing lies in its ability to create complex, customized objects layer by layer using materials ranging from plastics to metals and even biological substances. One of the most remarkable success stories of additive manufacturing can be seen in the aerospace sector. Uh, GE actually told us about it. Uh, an excellent example of how additive manufacturing revolutionized the aerospace industry is the development of the LEAP aircraft engine fuel nozzle. Aerospace companies have harnessed 3D printing to produce lightweight, high-strength components that were previously impossible to manufacture. The reduction in weight and improved performance of aircraft and spacecraft components has not only led to cost savings, but also enhanced safety and fuel efficiency. Another domain where additive manufacturing has made significant strides is in the healthcare industry. Customized medical implants, patient-specific prosthetics, even 3D printing or printed organs are on the horizon, revolution, revolutionizing patient care and improving the quality of life for many. many. And regarding the automotive industry, 3D printing is being used to design and produce complex parts, leading to lighter, more fuel efficiency, vehicles and enabling rapid prototyping of new designs. The success of stories of additive manufacturing are not limited to these sectors alone. It has found application in architecture, fashion, and consumer goods, enable designers and manufacturers to push the boundaries of creativity and functionality. In this way, it is important to recognize the vital roles that academies and governments play in fostering the growth and continuous process of 3D printing. Academies and research institutions are the forefront of developing new materials, processes, and technologies that expand the capabilities of 3D printing. Additionally, the governments have a crucial role to play in supporting and regulating additive manufacturing. As academies and governments collaborate with industry leaders, we can harness the full potential of additive manufacturing, advancing our economies, improving lives, and shaping a more sustainable future for all. Now, with this said, I will start with the questions for the panelists. The first one is for the three of you. And the question is, is additive manufacturing a real value generation or is it just a myth? Who wants to start? OK. <laughs> start. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I have to say that now is a real application. No, no, I think that it's very difficult to say that additive manufacturing will not be sustained in the time and will not be used. In fact, if, if we see the figures, additive manufacturing has been growing for the last 15 years and, and growing rapidly and non-linearly. So, so the, 
on the one hand, the, the number of OEMs that provide systems is growing. The number of uh, material makers and powder, metal powder, plastics, filaments is growing. The number of end users is growing, and the number of applications is growing. So uh, it's true that some sectors, some areas, the number of real application is not huge, but there are some specific applications that are becoming a success stories. So uh, in terms of reality, uh, I, I should say that additive manufacturing now is present in the industry and is an alternative. So. Okay. Um, I forgot to tell you that you have three minutes to explain your <laughs> position, okay? <laughs> so it's all right, you were fine. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, I completely agree with what uh, my colleague just said, uh, but I'll just add more to that. If it was a myth, we would not be here today. So <laughs> if we are here today, uh, that gives us a big message that um, the, it is a reality. Um, the, the only thing we need to know is that if we are not adopting it today from an industry perspective, then we will not sustain in the exactly. future. So it is super important that we start um, thinking about it uh, and we can bring all the different sectors together, industries, uh, academia, uh, policy makers, uh, our future generation, we need to think about the sustainability aspects uh, because it will be impacting us in the future. So we have to kind of start thinking about what, what are the technologies we need to invest in today, how quickly we can adopt and bring it to the future generation because we might see uh, some of the application 10%, 20% in the, in the next 10, 15 years or 20 years, uh, but our future generation, most of the technologies they will see around them will be developed by additive manufacturing. So mm -hmm. we have to think uh, quickly and most importantly focus on the future generation that how we will bring them and how we will educate and um, create that impact to them. Yes, yes, that's right. And I, I, from outside, I can see that the circle of producing, manufacturing, and distributing additive manufacturing industry is growing. You know, it's still developing. And every time that something is lacking in the circle, someone else, you know, in the world goes ahead and, and have it, you know, so for them, for us to use it. Thank you very much. I would like to add to the comments of my colleagues that uh, additive manufacturing is a reality depending on the application and mm. not only about the application, it's related about the right selection about the process, of course, the process parameters and material, and of course the design that we are trying to solve in that. It's uh, very common in the beginning of additive manufacturing applications that the industry tried to substitute other processes with additive manufacturing, directly substitute some processes. But right now, it's very easy to understand that the real potential, the real performance of additive manufacturing is depending on how the device or the component that must to be built by this technology is adapted mm -hmm. to the condition of these material process parameters and the geometry that it's uh, possible or not to, to to develop for this kind of application. So it's very important in terms to keep uh, the added value related with additive manufacturing, uh, keep an eye and keep in track how the material is performing during the process of joining, how the process parameters can modify the performance of the component and how the geometry must be related with performance. It, it means to meet the specification of the product and the component that that's, that's the real uh, three uh, components that must to be consistency in terms to, to apply additive manufacturing. So the sign? Uh, geometry, I, I geometry? guess that is, it's better to say geometry, material, and process parameters. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Leopoldo, is additive manufacturing more sustainable than other processes? That depends, <laughs> again. <laughs> Sorry, this is no direct answer for, for many things because um, of course that it's more sustainable depending on the amount of material that it's possible to, to use during the production. Of course, this is one way to, to, to have a measure, to have a track about the sustainability, but another way is the amount of energy used during mm -hmm. the process parameters. The third one is when you are using uh, other variables like um, the logistics, for example. If you have a big plant, I don't know, maybe in Mexico, and you must export these kind of components 
to a site far, far away from Mexico. Of course, that you must to have the uh, carbon footprint yeah. to, to these kind of devices or to these kind of technologies. But it's better if you have regional centers in terms of production and can, can be modified the way that we must to understand the sustainability about additive manufacturing. Of course, that inventory, this is another way to, mm -hmm. to measure the performance of additive of manufacturing. Course. It means if I don't uh, wait in some uh, space inside of the plant, because uh, we only produce when we need the device, mm -hmm. of course, that you are saving something related with uh, space and many others, footland. So um, that depends on the way that you analyze the sustainability. So the objective of the sustainability must be very clear when you are trying to, to develop the application of additive manufacturing. Okay. Um, Rafik, uh, many advantages are reported about additive manufacturing. Can you please mention some that you know first can? Thank you. Um, I think uh, everybody has interacted with additive manufacturing in many ways. So I'll just talk about three, four areas where I have interacted with them and which I think uh, are more important, um, especially for me. Um, so uh, one of the major one where all, uh, all of this additive manufacturing started is prototyping. So if you have a new product and you want to kind of launch that product and you want to develop um, the initial test on that, um, additive manufacturing would be the best uh, solution to start with. I'll give you an example of a personal protective respirator. When the COVID hit, uh, uh, we, I sat with my team and we started developing a personal protective respirator and we did a lot of uh, different models and it was pretty easy for us to kind of manufacture that even overnight. So we just uh, start with that and we actually, um, one of the respirator design was taking 18 hours to, to print, but it wasn't the, a big issue for us because we wanted to kind of test initial products, so we did. We did the test and once the initial product was developed after that we went to um, redesign the system for injection molding. So we reduced the time from 18 hours to uh, 30 minutes uh, with injection molding. So things like that can happen. Initially we have to kind of look into this as a prototyping technology for some cases, uh, but also uh, we talked about a lot about different types of application for new products, for oil and gas sector, for aerospace. Um, so all of these can be now manufactured um, with additive manufacturing. Another big uh, area which is uh, impacted uh, by additive manufacturing is the repair of existing products. So especially when it comes to um, oil in intensive um, industries, uh, they have huge parts which cost uh, uh, $50,000, for example, if they uh, have uh, damage on that part. Um, um, before throwing them, they can actually remanufacture that using additive manufacturing, either laser cladding or wire cut additive manufacturing. So now, previously those were not possible. Now yeah. uh, people can actually reuse those kind of technologies. One of the big other uh, application which we are doing is plastic recycling via additive manufacturing. It might not be a good idea for large scale uh, plastic recycling, but at least it's a good idea for home-based uh, plastic recycling or for smaller industry who has lots of plastic waste and they want to kind of reuse that for repurposing uh, it to certain products. Um, so those could be um, also a possibility for that. And then also on the construction side, we have seen lots of application in the construction today, large format uh, bridges, for example, even in Netherlands, uh, those are uh, possible today. So a lot of people are looking into kind of large format structures, which uh, doesn't require lots of precision. So those are uh, becoming a reality today. Thank you. Um, now the question is for uh, Aishun. We would like to know if additive manufacturing technologies are with widespread in Europe. Could you please tell us your experience? Yep. Uh, widespread, okay. Uh, they are widespread. Uh, you can find additive uh, manufacturing technology in many, many countries in Europe. And obviously they are not so popular as machining or casting or traditional mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing technologies, but yeah, the, the presence of additive manufacturing is becoming relevant in Europe. In, in my opinion, we can, we can make a two groups, three groups, let's say. Uh, the first one, the system manufacturers. So we have uh, manufacturers in north of Italy, mm -hmm. Portugal, France, Germany probably is the, the core one, as were more uh, suppliers of machines is by now, UK, so 
uh, we can find several companies that uh, they are producing machines, additive manufacturing machines, and they are developing products, so this is one of the big industries in, in terms of additive manufacturing. And the second group could be the end users. So there are companies, traditionally SMEs, but some medium-sized companies, which is focused 100% of uh, taking cut models from the, from the customers and uh, making parts uh, and send and delivery parts. So there are service bureaus that you can enter to the website, upload your models, choose the material, choose the quality, even the post-processing of the part, uh, the quotation, and when you pay, obviously, <laughs> then, <laughs> then send you the part in terms of days. So the, the, the number of companies which are promoting that kind of business model is, mm -hmm. uh, is growing. Uh, I, I forget the other relevant uh, area in, in Europe could be Netherlands. Um, in materials, for example, is from Netherlands, which is huge. So yeah, you, we can find that. And in the third group, we, we can talk about the huge companies that are using additive manufacturing as an alternative. So the big aerospace companies, automotive, uh, health industry, for example, the, an industrial case, which is a success story of additive manufacturing are the dental implants. Now mm -hmm. the, the dental implants, uh, the, the main criteria to, to uh, use additive manufacturing is the cost. The, the, they are building uh, dental implants much cheaper with additive manufacturing rather really? with other co uh, yeah rather with other uh, manufacturing so uh, it's a complex part quite small micro milling was an alternative personalized so additive manuf metal additive manufacturing has been the, um, uh, the the alternative so now the systems of powder red fusions focus on dental implants are uh, are one of the best sales now. Mm -hmm. Really, I didn't know that, so it's good to know that we will have, you know, dentures <laughs> with yeah. the manufacturing in the future. And I forget to say that Spain is one of the industries that uh, in, in dental implants is, is very relevant, so uh, yeah. it's one of, one of the, one of the countries. Really, thank you. Um, Leopoldo, from the role that MADIT has in Mexico in the development and use of these new sustainable additive manufacturing technologies, what are the success stories of MADIT in Mexico and how do you view the academia's national opportunities and challenges? Well, this is a, a big question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to keep in track about this kind of classification of the applications for additive manufacturing. So uh, it's very simple to identify the prototyping area of additive manufacturing. This field, in my opinion, of course, this is uh, a very ancient application of additive manufacturing. Say, control P and send to manufacture something, it's very common. Right now it's very easy. It's very common to have this kind of facilities and this kind of equipment in you know, almost every school, in different facilities uh, around the universities. It's very common to find this kind of uh, sites. The second one is more related with industrial applications like tooling and fixtures. This application right now is generating a lot of value in industry. It's very easy if you're planning to modify something during productions to produce a specific uh, fixtures, a specific grippers, a specific components, or sometimes a spare parts for the production line. It's very common, the application of additive manufacturing. And the third one is more related with the end, um, not the end use part, it, it means the, um, the a sprint component. It means that when you finish the production, you take the part and it's ready to use. In that field, the experience of MADIT uh, has different stages. The third one that is related to uh, the components ready to use when, when you finish the production of it, it's uh, maybe the most attractive for academia because it must require to fill the gaps between the yeah. material characteristics to have a very strong um, knowledge about the models, about the material uh, performance, about the uh, how the parameters affect 
-hmm. the production. Mm -hmm. Uh, you must to guarantee the performance of everything that you are running because it's it's uh, a little bit funny that you must to produce only one component. It's almost impossible to test in a destructive way this component. If not, uh, wh what are you doing about? So uh, it's very interesting how the prediction, the real engineering, the the models, the computer-aided simulation and engineering is fundamental for a good application of direct parts additive manufacturing. And the role of academia, of course, that start with the education, of course, that we start uh, um, giving to the fundamentals of additive manufacturing during uh, uh, the experience, during the role of the student inside of the university. We must to teach how to design, how to choose the right material, the mm -hmm. right process parameters. But at the end, uh, it's almost impossible to keep on track all the new alloys, all the new materials, all the new process parameters, all the new uh, characteristics of technology. It means right now it's a little bit common to have two lasers, uh, powder bed fusion, and four lasers and six mm -hmm. lasers. But I don't know, maybe five years ago, it's almost a, it was only a, an idea how to implement different lasers. So it's very important to teach how to identify, how to characterize yeah. all the parameters yeah. that it's necessary to, to, to keep it. on track in terms to, to give the, the real uh, application, to yeah. keep the reliability about the component that you are uh, building with, with that kind of technology. So this is the, the main area about the universities, how to, how to provide enough information, enough uh, analysis criteria mm -hmm. for the future engineering process that the, that the design was or must to be thinking like uh, really for additive manufacturing. I, I guess that this is, this is the real, um, the real uh, challenge for for this kind of universities like UNAM, Tecnológico de Monterrey, and Autónoma de Nuevo León, and many others that are part of this uh, big challenge that is MADIT. Exactly. How to maximize the, the value of what you're creating, not thinking about, you know, the, the, the functionality, but I mean, is it going to be commercial, you know, a, a success or not? What? Okay, thank you. Um, now, Rafik, regarding new material development and sustainable manufacturing technologies, what are the opportunities for academia and how must the engineering program curricula be adapted to prepare the new generation of engineers and scientists to fulfill society's needs? Um, I completely agree with uh, my colleague here um, that we really need to look into our academia. Um, because uh, when it comes to this pandemic, um, after pandemic, um, this disruption has certainly accelerated the pace of this technology development. Um, but what is happening right now is that the technology is going quite advanced and we, have, we still have the same kinds of curriculums available which was before pandemics. So we have to think about how do we actually uh, start disrupting our curriculum based on that, um, these technologies as well. So uh, starting with Industry 5.0, which focuses on three major areas, uh, sustainability is one of the big thing, uh, human-centric design and approaches, uh, and then resilience. So we need to think about how do we integrate that um, in terms of additive manufacturing into our curriculum. So starting with the sustainability, it is, uh, it is a big thing that how do we actually uh, create better processes, um, technologies, um, in use of this additive manufacturing so that we are creating less impact on our society. Um, but then also we need to focus on the human-centric approaches that we need to create better systems uh, which are easy to interact with human. Um, they are safer for a human. For example, we talked about a large format uh, additive manufacturing like laser cladding, uh, using robots or um, wire crack data manufacturing system using robots, um, but um, is it safe when a human is working with these kind of systems? Um, do we need to put them into cages or do we need to kind of uh, um, create an interactive environment with the human or do we need to create safer distances and safety uh, protocols around that? All these things are very important uh, when it comes to human-centric approaches. 
for system design and development, which we'll need to really focus on. Uh, and the third part is also the resilience part, uh, where we also need to start educating our uh, future generation that how do we actually build in resilience into our systems in the future, but also resilience for our, uh, our humans that even if this technology is adopted or not, uh, how do we actually interact with any other similar kinds of technology. So I think we need to really work on accelerated pace on our education systems as well. Uh, and this is not possible without uh, cross countries uh, collaboration because every country, every um, sector has its own uh, advantages and experiences. So we have to come come together, uh, work as a transdisciplinary team, mm -hmm. uh, develop curriculums and systems on a global level, and then kind of share those kind of ideas and technologies and uh, develop new spin-off companies and also the education system so that we can actually uh, have a better future for our kids. Yes, thank you. I hope from your perspective, we would like to know if there are, regu if there are regulations to use these technologies and what opportunities and challenges you see that could promote or limit the use? Is there, if there are regulations, oh, regulations. to okay. use these technologies, and what opportunities and challenges you see that could promote or limit the use of okay. this? I imagine you, that you mean regulations in, in terms of standards, exactly. certifications. certifications. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a very good question, and, and, and I think that's one of the, of the points of the challenges. Um, until I think it was 2015, the only regulations, uh, literally there were no regulations. So the, the only information that the potential customer or potential mm -hmm. user of additive manufacturing had was the OEM uh, data sheet. So the materials, machines, how operate. So the, the user was a little bit uh, fixed to the uh, to the information that the system uh, system OEM give to the to, uh, to the customer, and uh, then some internal development. Uh, then uh, uh, the Ameri the ASTM American Society yeah. of Testing Methods standards. started with some standards. I think it was in 2015, if I'm not wrong, and started developing some standards about terminology uh, because it was crazy, a lot of technologies with different uh, names. Sometimes the names were the same but with different patents. So by now, in, in from uh, this standard, we have a, a standard terminology, which mm -hmm. is good news for the customers and also started with some standards on how to measure materials, uh, ma machine calibration, and now these standards has become ISO, uh, international, international standard organization has uh, imported this standard, and as far as I know, there is a group specifically developing the standards for uh, additive manufacturing, and there is about 15 to 20, if I'm not wrong, uh, standards, fixed standards, that are uh, ISO level, so it's mm -hmm. good news. And on the third hand, the certification, yeah. uh, for me, is now the, the, the main challenge. And, and, and specifically in the aerospace sector, uh, the certification process is one of the mm, hardest and challenging uh, steps for uh, becoming a real part. There are some uh, parts flying. Uh, we have uh, the presentation of GE has been excellent and yeah, you can yeah. see them. But uh, basically uh, the certification process started with the material, then the machine, then the pair oh. of the material and the machine. And once everything is certified, we start with the part. So. The process is very long, and the European Agency and the FAA of uh, North America mm -hmm. Agency, which basically are the two main agencies in the world, uh, they have been um, making their certification for machine parts or casted parts from the 60s. Mm -hmm. But additive manufacturing is the new one now. Exactly. So there is no specific NATCAP uh, procedures to certify additive manufacturing parts, as far as I know. Uh, 
that. So each part is an individual part exactly. that needs its own certification procedure Standards to, and to get to the, yeah. to the plane. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yes, uh, every product that is manufactured by Aretid Manufacturing has to go through all this process, the material, the, the equipment, whatever, and then the product itself, isn't it? To ensure that it's safe to use. That's it. Okay. Now for the three of you, Regarding these changes, changes that are taking place through the use of new materials and sustainable manufacturing technologies, what would be your recommendation for universities and industry to support transformation plans and accelerate positive, positive impacts? From your point of view, what should be the expected role that the new ecosystem called Core Lab for Additive Manufacturing should have for you? Anyone that wants to start? So um, I can start. I think uh, core labs uh, like uh, this one can have a major role, especially from the basic research to the industry. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I, there was a chart presented by Siemens um, or, or another company uh, this morning. I forgot the name, but um, I think it, th those kind of bridging gap between the university and industry is super important. And uh, a lot of researchers, they don't have that uh, kind of possibility to do that. So um, I think uh, core labs should really focus more on how to translate the fundamental research into technologies which can actually disrupt the future, uh, but also kind of create and think about the spin-off companies and how they can actually support their, those companies and kind of in their advent, adventure to go to uh, public and kind of create a better impact outside the country. Um, I, and then also fostering uh, international collaboration. That would be uh, a great place for uh, Core Lab to start with because um, you have the equipment, you have the, uh, the brains and the possibilities, and you can bring uh, lots of expertise from outside. Thank you very much. May I continue with mm -hmm. the answer? It's, it's very interesting because Core Labs, it's like a very expensive playground where it's possible to run all the possibilities to run all the tests that you have in mind in terms to fill the gap between the, the real application. So Core Labs, it's a huge opportunity for industry. It's a huge opportunity for students because there is, there is a place where it's possible to play with everything, okay. new alloys, new parameters, new geometries. And for industry, it's an, a huge window related with, okay, I, I'm not, uh, decided yet if is the time or the right time for the investment. So it's possible to, to be in that place and, mm -hmm. and, and test almost all the, all the real concerns about if the final component is ready or not for my application. So core labs are maybe the, the, best, uh, the best of two worlds between the students, between academia, of course, it's the area where the industry is able to test a lot of things and where the government is possible to see if the, the real value that kind, that kind of technologies are able to, okay. to, to support. Exactly. And what kind of regulations we need to put in place as well, you know, exactly. to get in the safer to the public. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with the colleagues, but I just I, I will say divided in universities and companies. Uh, on the one hand, I think that the role of the university is a key factor, is, is, is key in, in technology transfer in two levels. The first one, the transfer of, of trained people, of talent. So additive manufacturing should be or must be introduced in, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I don't need, I, I don't think that, uh, uh, an additive manufacturing engineer is needed. So uh, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more in the line that uh, mechanical engineers, material engineers uh, uh, just introduce yeah. specific subjects or specific modules of additive manufacturing. So this is, a, this is one, one key role of the university and the other one with, with the, the, the lab that we see yesterday in the core lab, and the, technolo the direct technology transfer with real equipment, real uh, industrial equipment with uh, talent, with PhD, going deep in the technology. This, this is the, the key role. And on the other hand, the role of the companies is to, to finance that activity, to, to consider that this is 
not a wasting money but an investment so so the collaboration between the universities and the and the companies should be the, the pillar should be the confidence of getting into this technology and, and taking the idea of that will be an investment uh, for the future so the invitation is for the industry to get uh, advantage of the core labs because they will have to test to try the technologies that are there and we have they will have the talent to work in their problems you know to get near the universities and uh, use this core lab that is going to be the, the transforming from knowledge to apply uh, science uh, in the industry and um, how many universities in the world, more or less percentage have, uh, I don't want to say core lab, but additive manufacturing in, in, role in their uh, curricula uh, of the engineers? Do you think everyone? No idea. I don't know. No but, idea. But I think that the number is pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. At least hundreds, yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. At least. And uh, regarding countries? You know, which are the ones that have the most advanced uh, curricula for the students, for engineering students in additive manufacturing? It's, it's difficult to identify that. I, I guess that almost all the universities that are interested with engineering, with design and manufacturing has a, a specific, at least a topic related with additive manufacturing. But uh, in my opinion, we must to keep on track this mm -hmm. kind of condition. It's not necessary to make a, a new career, please, <laughs> related <laughs> with additive manufacturing. Of course, that there are specific topics, but this is only a new, this is only a technology that requires a very strong knowledge about materials, but really, really strong. We must to have a, a very strong um, education about the statistical process, design of experiments, mm -hmm. and many other uh, fields related with how to monitor in the results. And we must to keep a very strong uh, relation with computer aided design in terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and many other fields. So in my opinion, it's necessary to increase the, the robustness of all these topics mm -hmm. inside of the universities, and it's not necessary to create a new career. This is only my, my point of view, of course. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, and I always tell my students uh, that we don't need uh, mechanical engineers anymore, we don't need electrical engineer anymore, we don't need mechatronics engineer anymore. We need mechatronics engineer who, specialize, who has skills in data manufacturing. Mm. We need a mechanical engineer who know how to program in Python. Mm. Uh, so all these should be skills and should be taught as skills. Yeah. Um, but there should be a core degree uh, course which okay. will back up these kind of skills. Thank you. So we have some questions from the public that is following us in Facebook and the, and the networks. Halim is asking, which are the scope of additive manufacturing in the steel industry? What, whoever. Who is, sorry? Which is the scope of additive manufacturing in the steel industry? So uh, I can go steel industry. So I, I can go, I think one of the big one um, is uh, related to huge construction structures. So a lot of people are now using additive manufacturing to kind of aid on certain uh, parts into the existing construction okay. structures. Um, it could be also bridging, for example, I talked about earlier, um, developing a bridge or different structure or ergonomic structures, for example, <laughs> in the steel industry, those could be uh, major ones. Um, so I think uh, the, starting from there, and then you can also look into the repair processes using additive manufacturing, um, uh, and then also mostly looking into new qualified products which could be used um, in uh, oil rigs or any other uh, um, kind of uh, oil-related industries as well. And I would like to complement this, this answer because if we are talking about the steel industry, they are changing the way or the mix that they have the, the material ready for use. For example, uh, right now it's uh, better, I guess, for, for many steel industry to have, uh, for example, powder or wires mm -hmm. ready to use for additive manufacturing instead of produce a sp a specific uh, components and keep an inventory of that. So that it's it cool, going to change the, the way that the steel industry are selling the material, yeah, the raw material. 
just complementing the, the answer, the, there, there are companies, there's a European company of steel, quite relevant, that uh, have developed specific material for metal additive. Uh, so it's an opportunity for, mm -hmm. for this industry in terms of raw material providers mm -hmm. because the, the material is more high added value, it's more the, 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 the benefit of, of that kind of material maybe it's, uh, it's higher than a conventional steel. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this question you answered a little bit in the, the last question, the, the one before this, but I'm going to rephrase it again for you. Miguel Angel Gracia Pinilla, in your experience, what kind of changes need implement the universities in order to close the gap between the emerging technologies and that uh, has additive manufacturing and the degree plans? Mm -hmm. We discussed a little bit before, but if yeah. you can expand. Okay, uh, I try to answer. Uh, we are we are lecturing. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I lecture additive manufacturing from 2015, something like that, so seven years. And for me, the the most challenging is to to get on the edge. Uh, every year, mm, something new happens. <laughs> so it's very necessary to keep. Uh, in the day to day, watching what is new, uh, uh, with new applications, new technologies, new materials, new materials appear. Uh, so, for me, this is one of the most challenging uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. And the other one, and maybe technically is the most relevant, is try to change the brain of the students, yes, right, yeah. which are very focused on the design of typically square, flat geometries. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and in the lunch uh, with some colleagues, I told that I, uh, during this uh, seven, eight years, uh, I do the same uh, experience. In the first day, I uh, took a student in the blackboard and, and I said, please draw, draw a hole. And always, every year, the hole is straight and round, <laughs> and, and, and this is the, 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 technically the most challenging is change the defect because traditionally the, the success cases of additive manufacturing is when you redesign the component, the component from scratch mm -hmm. and not using traditional techniques. So for me it's probably there are these the two, the two main challenges. Is so I can just add one more thing. I completely agree with uh, my colleague here, but just want to add one thing on the hands-on experience. I think we really need to uh, integrate experiential learning uh, using additive manufacturing technologies into the curriculum. Um, now, I mean, you can buy a, a simple 3D printer with $200 quite easily. Um, uh, so you can, we need to find ways to integrate those kind of uh, systems into the curriculum so people can go um, and have hands-on experience on developing certain products. Um, one of the things which I do in my personal courses, I ask them to design a particular product and I tell them that first design this product for additive manufacturing and then design the same thing for um, machining purposes. So in both cases, the technology, if it's complex or not, um, they will come up with a complete different designs and they have to go through that thinking process that if my manufacturing technology is different, how do I adopt myself to that? And then they go and experience that on a real machine and system. And they develop it, the programming around that, they manufacture it and they give the final product, deliver the final product within the, um, the course limit so they can get the real feel of what the technology can do and what they can actually design. And it's quite interesting in the beginning they will come up with a very interesting idea of a particular product, but when they go to manufacturing it, a lot of these will not work in the okay. field. So then they have to think about how do they readopt their design um, to the real world experience. So I think hands-on experience um, techniques will really be very necessary. important. Yeah. And m maybe it's possible to synthesize this, this kind of ideas that the complexity is very welcome, only if the cost is keep it. <laughs> the performance is increasing mm -hmm. and the reliability is achievable. That's, that's the only way, I guess. Now from the public here, do we have any questions?
Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I would like just uh, to see what are your thoughts regarding all this environment that you have already seen here in Nuevo León State, the government involved, the industry involved, the academia involved, and the international collaborators that we have it all over the world here in, in Nuevo León. And I think that you had already the chance to talk each other. So I would like to know what is going to be the next stage based on what we have seen here that we may pursue together in order to really add value to our society by using these novel technologies. So it's an open question. <laughs> <laughs> this is not, uh, not uh, a bad question, my friend, but my opinion, this is only the gasoline. We need the spark. And the real spark must to be the motivation of the industry. I, I try to explain or to, to, to say something more about that. Of course, that if you have the right ecosystem, it's OK. But that depends on the kind of industry that are close of this ecosystem. If you have a, a compromise related with the amount of uh, components and the amount of parts, or you must to, uh, meet all the regulations, all the standards for a specific industry, that could be a little bit difficult to, to, to take advantage of this, these opportunities. But if you're thinking in new business models, you are thinking how to improve, how to, who, to develop new products, and you start to thinking how additive manufacturing can solve this kind of, um, this kind of issues, of course, that this is a huge opportunity for that. So this is only my, my point of view, of course, that, but try to solve all the, the problems in, in terms of numbers, in terms of production rate, and many others for industry. It's so difficult with additive manufacturing at this point. But if you have a new business in, in, in your mind and it's possible to solve with additive manufacturing, this is the, the real application. The healthcare industry, for example, implants, it's a very good business because mm -hmm. they change the way that, that they, they produce them, how to test it, how, how to uh, make a specific design for everyone. So uh, I'll just add um, something with this uh, quote from Henry Ford. It says that coming together is beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. So I think we have started the beginning. Um, we need to find opportunities, and how do we uh, actually work together? And I have been working with tech for almost uh, five, six years now uh, with different projects, and uh, I think one of the easy things would be exchange of students between um, the institutions and then looking for further opportunities, funding, and we, I think uh, industry would be instrumental on both sides. So we need to find industry, um, pick the real problem, and then uh, go find the expertise on both sides and uh, with the, within the room and then kind of identify different projects and start working together. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, okay, predicting the future is, is quite hard. Um, and, uh, but I have to say that uh, it's my first time in Monterrey, and what I have seen is the, the core lab, the industries, the nearshoring opportunity, uh, the, and, and, and mainly the, the tech of Monterrey ecosystem and, and the, uh, the University of Nuevo León also. So, so the, the, you have the talent, the machines also are only machines. If there is no talent, there is, if there is no people. So, so I think that the, the opportunity, the, the, the traffic lights seems to be in green. So let's see. But for example, yesterday we were talking about the startups, the new startup building to promote new companies. Additive manufacturing is traditionally um, a, a technology that promotes startups and, and, and buying one machine and starting making parts and going on. So why not? I think that the, 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 the opportunity is there and let's see. Thank you. Uh, so just let us start. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for you, for your contribution. We are over the time. I don't know if you can add the coffee time maybe. Uh, talk with them because uh, they were, were very strict to me and I say just the time you <laughs> know so I don't want to go I'm overhead okay thank you very much
uh, for your uh, points of view, and uh, I hope the, the public has already appreciated your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you.